Hi, a couple of years ago I started getting into D&D. As my passion for D&D grew, so did my collection of minis. And like many others out there, I now have boxes of shame. Legions of unpainted minis. Now this is my underdog story. This is me painting every single one of my miniatures. Hi guys, today I thought I was going to make a little bit more of a dent in my boxes of shame. I've uh, selected the Gorma uh, from Reaper Bones, which is a huge <laughs> miniature. Um, it's uh, supposed to be sort of a, a version of Purple Worm, uh, which is a huge gargantuan monster for Dungeons and Dragons. So, unboxing this mini, I uh, first uh, tried to dry fit everything. Just making sure that I know what goes where and, and such. And also, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the potential seam lines uh, at this point. Just, just sort of trying to gauge how um, how deep they are. How you know if I would need to come in with some milliput or not. And you can see it's quite an impressive mini. It has a base also, uh, which looks quite nice. This is how it will look like, uh, unpainted, and uh, yeah. First things first, we need to uh, remove some of the mold lines. So for this, since Reaper bones are made of this sort of uh, much more softer plastic, I uh, opted to go for uh, a hobby knife, being very careful and just sort of trying to scrape away um, the lines that I saw that, that looked, uh, you know, made it look uh, artificial, if you will. Uh, and there weren't that many. Uh, they were mostly reg in, uh, you know, the, the sort of, uh, not the teeth, but the claws. There were some on the base as well that were quite uh, prominent, but most, uh, most mode lines were quite fine. At this point, I realized that I wanted to probably put the base on something a little bit more firm, so I just drew out on a piece of um, MDF, a piece of MDF, um, just so I have the shape of the, the actual base. At this point I used uh, Citadel's uh, mold re remover tool because it, it it just made it more simple on the actual body. Now on to the base. The reason why I wanted to do this was two part. I wanted to have some sort of a black um, edge that I could sort of, uh, as usual, just frame this mini in. So I tried my best to sort of cut uh, out a piece that was somewhat flush. It didn't have to be perfect. I knew I could fix it afterwards, but uh, as perfect as, as possible. And be careful when you do this, guys. Those knives are generally quite sharp. And as we can see here, it's not a perfect fit, but it's getting there. Uh, just to sort of get off the, you know, make it a little bit smoother, I just used a file just to sand off uh, the edges a little bit. All right. So what you didn't see here was I uh, washed the entire mini with some uh, dish washing uh, detergent and uh, just a toothbrush. Leave it out to dry and once it had dried completely I uh, started basically with gluing stuff together and I start with the base. had to have a whole lot of super glue and just trying to fit that and then I used uh, well, what are these called uh, grips to just make sure that the, it was evenly sort of distrib distributed um, I started out with the the neck piece uh, I guess you can call it the the part where all of the teeth will go this one demanded to be sort of uh, pushed in quite hard uh, so you even saw probably the camera shake, the violent force of, of Leif trying to hold a plastic piece together. After that, it was uh, gluing in basically the different sets of teeth. And be very careful with uh, where they go, because uh, only um, each piece has its specific uh, spot. And sometimes, like, I seem to remember this piece, the upper piece, was kind of a snug fit. But eventually, it just, you know, plopped in there and 
uh, it was quite easy to, you know, to hold it uh, a couple of seconds until the super glue um, sort of bonded somewhat to hold it in place. And then the two individual teeth on the sides, and those were quite easy as well. Uh, and then it's time for the base and uh, try to get the actual uh, Gorma on the base. This proved actually a little bit difficult. You're seeing the quick and dirty version, so to speak, but it was quite uh, honestly, I had to actually uh, maintain pressure for some while so that it became um, bonded. Here you can see the scale, that's a normal 25 or 28 millimeter. And now it's time for priming. Now, um, I wanted to be very, very sort of selective with where I uh, got my Xenophil priming. So I decided to actually prime using my airbrush. Uh, so there I was using a Panzer Gray, which is almost black. It's like very, very dark. Uh, black so any uh, black or dark gray primer should do. I'm opting to go for a Xenophil priming because I, I had a little idea I wanted to try out. Um, I've in the past week been trying glazing and whatnot and I've sort of get, gotten my eyes uh, open a little bit for inks and, and their transparent uh, properties. So, um, did a black coat first and then a white. Uh, and here, you can see that I'm not aiming it from 90 degrees or anything like that. The important thing I wanted to achieve was that all of the plates should have darkness in their sort of, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the sort of uh, the nooks and, and, and crannies. But everything else should get a shot of white sort of from, from a good high angle. So that meant moving the model around quite a bit until I had something like this, which I felt was kind of happy. You can see that the shadows are in between the, the plates. Now, at this point, I went in with some violet transparent ink. I wanted to try this because this should uh, yield a very nice result. Uh, it should essentially be like uh, glazing. I'm just tinting the actual existing um, Xenophil uh, highlighting or Xenophil priming. And I'm happy to say this worked like a charm. It looks pretty awesome already here. You can see the potential. Um, there was some overspray on the belly there. You can see the, um, which I, I'm gonna want to paint in a different color. Now to get a little bit more character, I decided to go in with a second purple, which is a little bit more blue. And what I'm doing here is, um, it's hard to see from this angle, but what I'm doing is I'm going in, imagine in between each and every one of those claws that are attached to um, the plates, I'm going in on the, in the middle of those just to get a little bit, a bit of color variation on the actual plates. And it really helps if you have one of these spinning boards so you can sort of work with the model uh, piece by piece because it's quite tricky uh, model uh, the way it's posed and uh, to sort of uh, get a good angle everywhere. Now at this point, I wanted to go in with some yellow on the belly. Now, I am a fairly <laughs> noob when it comes to airbrushing. So at first I started and it was fine. And I lowered my, the pressure on my uh, airbrush. But even though I lowered it, because I needed to get close, and I needed to get underneath the neck and whatnot. And even though I lowered it, I could not escape the horror of spider webbing. So, at this point, I decided to, you know what, stop. I'm gonna do the rest with a brush. So I came with some Vallejo heavy cover colors, just a sort of gold brown color, uh, just to sort of try to uh, literally rebuild um, the color on the, the stomach, which was nice because I had some overspray from the purple and I knew that um, I would have had to cover 
with that yellow ink. I would have had to sort of make so many coats that, uh, yeah, I would have gotten old and grey. Once that was done, I uh, put it, put some off-white into the palette, just mixing up a brighter version of this. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to pick out some color variations and some edge highlighting. And I put some more white and mixed in a little bit of yellow just to get uh, sort of a, a skeleton, I guess, uh, color. Uh, or, or a very bright uh, yellow. This I used to uh, basically glaze the teeth, the main teeth in his, uh, in his maw, so to speak, in his mouth. Uh, now, this is something that I had to go back and forth a lot of time. You're going to see this uh, all through the, the actual process. So once um, the plates had dried properly, I also went in with some dry brush. I just use uh, a much sort of more less saturated purple, a brighter color. So something gray purple will do uh, perfectly. Here I'm just trying to pick out the plates and I'm going against the plates so that I will hit the edges the most and not the shadows uh, almost at all, which is exactly what I'm uh, after. So I'm going through the plates and even the actual sort of parts of the mouth um, that sort of um, where the teeth are. At this point, uh, I started the tedious work with an off-white color of just sort of trying to uh, paint all of these. Um, I'm not sure if I should call them claws or teeth. I'm guessing that it uses this to propel itself through the ground as it burrows uh, through earth and stone and whatnot. So whatever, it's it's uh, it's claws that it has along the body, uh, just trying to go in with a very sort of. Um, fairly opaque uh, color because I'm I know I'm gonna go in and, and define these uh, with some shades and uh, after that probably a little bit of highlighting this is what we have so far uh, I'm, I'm liking the result I think uh, I'm on, on a good way now I used uh, army painter scar tissue which was a super thick color it was like it didn't even you know it didn't even float. It was almost very gel-like when I got it out on a wet palette. So I, I put in some medium and then some glaze medium and then actually had to put in more thinner. And eventually I got it to a somewhat good consistency. Now with this, I started just glazing um, what I would call the sort of uh, his, his gum area, uh, which uh, I define at least to be where his uh, actual teeth are. That's sort of uh, the area. And then I'm gonna go in also and try to ever so slightly let this uh, pink color um, influence the, the purple sort of body a little bit. So I created a, a fade. So you can almost see from, from the side or from behind it. Oh yeah, there's something more fleshy coming along, I guess. Uh, then to define his mouth, I just used uh, the inner parts of his mouth. I just use a darker shade of pink uh, and then just trying to feather that out while the, the rest of the pink paint was uh, wet. So you can actually see if you look closely that he has a bunch of small teeth in his actual mouth. I'm not bothering with them now. I'm just trying to make the fade uh, look sort of nice. And as uh, one area dries, I go over it again. So this probably was at least in two, three sort of uh, layers of paint. So while that's drying, I figured I would start out uh, with a, a sort of defining the basic color of the base. I went with uh, earth color. Uh, I um, wanted something that sort of was in the same uh, color scheme and I wanted something warm. So uh, I'm just covering all of that. And of course, every once in a while that was a very sloppy job. You do boo-boo, so I just went in and, uh, and redefined the white claws. At this point, uh, the teeth had dried, so I, I'm just going in with um, some seraphim sepia just to sort of um, get them all yellowed. 
And for me, it's particularly important that I get all of the indentations in the teeth and at the root of the teeth, if that makes sense. So what I'm looking for is to get the teeth to look a little bit more whiter the further out you get. Since I had the Seraphim Sipia out, I also did some definition on, the, on his belly. And at this point, I'm coming in with some, uh, some off-white to try to glaze uh, a highlight or trying to basically make his teeth seem whiter the further out they are. So imagine that the root of a teeth should have some yellow uh, disgustingness, but at the very top of them, um, that's the part that has been used quite a lot and there's not a lot of, oh God, food, I guess, <laughs> getting stuck there. So that's the, what I, the way I thought about it. So uh, while I'm letting that dry, I'm going in on the actual plates and I'm, I put on some Army Painters purple wash. Any purple wash will do here. I'm trying to just get um, the dry brushing to sort of come back down a little bit and uh, redefining some of the shadows. And where I ended this purple wash was essentially where his gums start. So you can see I've decided that that is the line where there will be no more purple after that. But for the gum, since it had dried while I was washing it, I used uh, Army Painter's Red Wash. And here I was fine with the Red Wash going over a little bit to the purple uh, as well, just to sort of help that uh, blend out a little bit. And then of course I used some Red Wash also uh, on the inside of his mouth, just to sort of make all of those details pop a little bit more. Now you can see uh, this is the result that we have so far. Uh, so at this point I'm just gonna let him dry a little bit and then I started again <laughs> with glazing the teeth. I thought they weren't uh, white enough. And here's where we are when uh, all of the washed, uh, washes has, had dried. One of the things that I didn't feel uh, came out enough was his gum. So I went in back and did a glaze on some of the highlights, trying to get uh, a little bit more, I guess, a, a wet feeling on his gums and uh, a little bit more. Um, I wanted them to seem very fleshy, so that meant putting in some highlights here and there. Uh, and remember that, uh, don't forget the, the actual inside of his mouth, so uh, it's also very important just to get some highlights. Here you can see that I'm now starting to define uh, and pick out the teeth that Gormo has inside of his actual mouth. They're much smaller teeth, so just a little dab of white will do. I'm purposely leaving some of that, um, some of that pink in there, so it looks like it's, uh, it's a teeth and gum. Now, uh, the purple wash had dried and it, of course, it got a little bit everywhere. So I just used some white to, to uh, redefine the teeth. Here I'm just using what I had on the palette, some sort of uh, off, you know, white, uh, light brown, just to sort of do a first dry brushing on the actual ground, picking out some of the highlights. And I think I also, I'm not showing it, but I think at that point also did some dry brushing on the belly. And here I'm going with some fairly uh, bright off-white just to pick out some more dots of uh, sort of gum inside his mouth. Here I'm using Agrax Earthshade for the actual base once that dry brushing had dried just to get some of that shadow definition. And this is what it looks like now. I'm gonna leave this to dry for a moment. And here I'm coming in with a second coat of uh, red wash uh, inside the mouth. I didn't feel it was red enough, so I wanted a little bit more punch in that uh, saturation. And like you can see here, I'm, I'm trying to make uh, that feather from the purple to pink a little bit better. 
this point I also was, uh, wanted to make sure that he dried the correct way because I was only using the mouth. Now, I'm not sure exactly why, but uh, the color always was a little bit sticky when I was painting this. So I decided to go in with some uh, Krylon matte varnish just to sort of get a seal. And as you can see, autumn has uh, very much come to Sweden. So this is what we have now. And here I'm just putting in some black on the edge just to get that nice uh, framed definition. Here I'm gonna go in with some seraphim sepia and some Q-tips. What I'm doing essentially is I'm gonna sort of wash uh, four or five teeth at a time and then I come in with the Q-tip and I sort of just take off the top of it. And what happens then is that we will actually remove the wash, which means that we get a highlight. And this is what it looks like once I've gone through the entire body, and I'm liking that result quite a lot. And at this point, it was time to do another layer of varnish. So the reason why I varnished before was because I knew I was coming in with Q-tips and I didn't want the color to, um, to sort of get removed. Now, at this point, it's time to uh, come in with some gloss varnish. He has a large mouth and I can imagine that he's a quite slimy sort of uh, character. He, he should have lots of sort of wet areas in that mouth. I can just see that mouth sort of being pushed together and then at, at the time when he attacks, it just flies open I, and I wanted this part to be quite wet and messy and disgusting. So I'm putting lots of gloss varnish there and giving it a good time to dry. But meanwhile, I figured I would put some tufts for scale. They look almost like dead grass or something like that. So I'm just looking for nice cracks in the formations on the base. And I'm using a small tongue or something just to sort of push them inside cracks in between the rocks. That felt like the most natural place where potentially grass might uh, sort of be able to grow. That's what we have so far. And at this point, I, uh, I, like I said, I was going to make the mouth disgusting. So I'm using actually UV resin uh, with a UV torch. And here you can actually see that I even managed to time. This will take a little bit of a nice dexterity saving throw, but I even managed to actually uh, time it as a drop was sort of coming off the teeth. It looks quite cool, I have to say. And with that, let's look at the final result. I am super happy with uh, this paint job, I have to say. I think uh, if I have to be sort of looking at my own painting, this is my best work so far. And here is another uh, character for scale. You can see it's quite a large uh, beast. Now, my goal with this was to use it in a Dungeons and Dragons game, and you might wonder, how did that go, Leif? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and it looks to be a large purple beast. Oh, man. Uh, we're no chance to this beast. Well, after that somewhat successful presentation, I decided it was time for Gourmet to also enjoy the Swedish autumn. Alright guys, uh, like, share and subscribe if you liked this video. And with that, I bid you a fond farewell. Adieu.